Every time I stopped, the moonlight seemed to carry the slight tinkle of the dog bell I was listening for so intently. I stood there, heron-like, one foot in the air, afraid to put it down for fear that the slightest noise might mute the one sound I was waiting for. But the evening was a mocking one. I felt they might as well have been searching for a leprechaun or stalking the pot of gold at the end of a rainbow. I had last seen Pat about 10 a.m. when she had found and pointed a woodcock. When I shot, she broke, as usual, since I wasn't too meticulous on that nicety, and up in front of us flushed a prime white-tailed buck. Before this, Pat had been, at worst, a five-minute deer chaser, just a little run to satisfy your instincts. I hadn't been overly concerned, but this time as they flashed through the woods, I had the feeling that five minutes wouldn't get the job done. And twelve hours later, as worried as I was angry, proved my hunch to be right. As English setters go, Pat wasn't your once-in-a-lifetime dog. She was stubborn, willful, and vain. But I had trained her to a point where, when all went well, I could get a decent day shooting over her. But when all didn't go well, it could be an absolute disaster. Many days I simply gave up and led her back to the kennel in the station wagon, deciding to, to do the best I could all by myself. I guess I kept her for a variety of self-indulgent reasons, my refusal to admit I hadn't done as good a job of training as I should have, my tendency to spoil her and overlook the little hard-headed acts that usually led to bigger transgressions, and my plain soft-heartedness in refusing to come down harder and more often, a practice which might or may not have made a little bit of a difference. But by 10 p.m., all I could think of was a hurt dog lying in a roadside ditch waiting for me to come and find her, or a dog in the bottom of an abandoned well listening to my call and whistle and her answering bark tumbling back down on her in hollow, miserable mockery. I envisioned her collar hung on a wire fence, her foot in a forgotten fox trap, Anger and self-pity slowly gave way to fear and frustration, so strong it nearly made me sick to my stomach. It was I who was the guilty one now, and she the one needing desperately to have me come and find her. I had sat there listening to the night sounds, jet planes. I'd rather have had been north winds. I'd rather the horns and screeching tires have been the night calling of geese and herons, and the sense of loss grew. Nothing comforted me. Everything seemed wrong. I felt like a small and simple man looking and listening for a lost dog while an impersonal and mechanical world went right on by without stopping to help or even pausing to care. The next day I told a friend I was upset about losing my dog, but he paid no attention to my grief. Dogs are not worldly goods. That night I returned to where I'd left my hunting coat with a slight belief that Pat would be there waiting for me, but the coat was an empty mockery of hope. I whistled and listened through yet another night, not knowing what else to do. Anxiety and fear were shoved aside by a feeling of futility and helplessness. The airplanes and traffic sounds made me feel more alone than ever before. I was on some strange sort of island. I called the police, but they showed little interest in only a lost dog. A check of neighboring houses and farms led to nothing. They promised to call if they saw a white English setter, but somehow I didn't feel encouraged. To them, I was just an annoying stranger with a petty problem. I was a suspicious character to several, disbelieved by others, and in my mind, ignored by all. By now, the night vigil had taken on another emotional aspect, for I was searching for an unknown thing. Pat had become a symbol as real as any physical being. I needed to find her not only because I was committed to ending the mystery, but because I wanted to take her to these uncaring people and say, in effect, here's the dog I ask you about. See how much we enjoy each other? Do you understand now how much it meant for me to have your help and understanding? I wanted them to learn something about strangers and lost dogs and kindness and caring enough to listen to the hurt of others with some sympathy. There was little sense in wandering about, since Pat, no doubt, was doing the same thing, so I chose instead to find a spot to use as a listening post. I chose a long, slanting fallen oak whose branches had caught in another tree. I climbed up, rested my back against the limb, and watched the evening mist beneath me like a silken sea. Here, suspended in space and time, my imagination was free to create a scene of a dog running a deer for a day. Then, just as she's about to give up and come home, another deer jumps in front of her, and then another. Unable to stop herself, Pat is led into land she can never leave. I imagined a dog barking, and another answering, and then a third calling. 
My imagination flowed freely once again. One dog started barking, and then dogs all across the country entered one another in an endless chain of howls in recognition of all the dogs that have suffered at the hands of man in the cold light of the moon. I listened for a dog calling my name. I placed a small ad in the local paper, Lost Dog, it said, and my name and telephone number, a description of Pat and the promise of a reward, but I had no faith in it. Almost a week had passed, and I was running out of things to do, yet I still felt that I had to do something. The fading moon was just a twist of lemon, like a discarded rind, making the night seem ominous. I bought a star book, lay back on my oak bed, and tried to memorize the Pleiades, Orion, and Betelgeuse. I thought of the ancient desert shepherds and their nighttime philosophies on the stars. I thought of their naked minds relating the unrelatable, glibly marrying suspicion, myth, and astrology, and trying to find a meaningful place for themselves, all being surrounded by nothing except the incredible extension of nothing but intellect. And I was bewildered when I thought how much of it had really worked out after all. But in the long run, philosophy is a comfort only to philosophers, and I am not really one of those incredible abstract thinkers. Just a small, cold man, lost in the woods, being hunted, I hoped, by a hungry, homesick bird dog. I tried the old hunter's trick of imagining what I would do if I was a lost dog, where would I go, what would be the limits of my endurance, but this was idle foolishness. Pat could literally be anywhere, around the next turn, or in another world. The night vigil had lost its feeling of function, and I took to driving around more and sitting less. A pointless use of time, perhaps, but maybe, just maybe, I would find Pat. I gave up and over a week had passed. I took the kennel out of the station wagon and avoided going near the dog run by the barn. My family had long since stopped talking about hunting in an effort to be kind to me, but it didn't matter. My own feelings were mixed, a sense of loss, a deep guilt, and worst of all, a nagging uncertainty. I didn't really believe Pat was gone. I couldn't conceive or cope with the idea of forever. I still drove around the area where she had run away, but more like a person trying to wake up from a bad dream than from any real hope of seeing her sitting by the side of the road, listening for the familiar sound of my car. People would recognize me and wave, and a couple of kids knew me as the lost dog man. My mind searched for a simple solution. I imagined she had been hit by a passing car and then crawled into the woods and gone to sleep, undetected by the driver. It was neat, logical, likely, and unsatisfactory. Other possibilities came to mind, but none were any better. After two weeks, the painful sense of loss faded, leaving a numb feeling of emptiness. I still caught myself listening for her bark when I pulled in the driveway, but the empty spots where she used to lie seemed ordinary again, and I didn't think about feeding time anymore. I felt better when I reminded myself that she was just an ordinary working field dog, nothing to brag about, spoiled, mischievous, and yet it hurt to remember that Pat was my dog in every sense of the word. She thought of me everywhere, slept on my chair when I let her in the house, and loved riding in the front seat of the car. The simple truth was that Pat had gotten to me in her own way more than I had been readily willing to admit before. I felt almost ashamed to be so sentimental. It was difficult to imagine a man my age crying alone in his car for the sight of a small white dog, but it happened, and it happened more than once. This was all some time ago, and I'd never seen or heard of Pat again. But I'm past grief now. Her image in my memory remains like a poorly focused snapshot of a white dog off in an alder thicket, indistinct and distant like a ghost or a drifting wraith of mist. They say that time heals all wounds, but that's not wholly true. Sometimes we can work around the reality and believe in a hereafter when we have to, imagining a lost dog living with someone else far away, a kind and gentle master who has discovered that she loves to ride in the front seat of the car with the window open, hates peanut butter sandwiches, and will for no apparent reason cock her head and stand stock still for the longest time, as if she were listening for a faint whistling carried on the evening wind and the calling of a name she still vaguely remembers. Lately there's been an upsurge in the popularity of what's called a versatile gun dog. The term covers several breeds, all European in origin. Now, while I'm not knocking any claims about them as such, I'd like to point out that this country has had such a dog for longer than I can remember. 
It's not really a breed. It's more of a type. I had one when I was a kid. Nearly everyone else I knew had one at some time or another. You might call it a brown dog. Brown dogs are not really all brown. Some run a little orange in the coat, and others have a pronounced grayish but lackluster cast. Still, common brown is the predominant shade. The hair may be sort of long, although not necessarily, and can be either smooth or rough or in between. They have a peculiar three-quarter sideways gait, as if the front wheels are out of alignment, and they tend to use only one back leg at a time, resting one or the other alternately, unless an emergency occurs requiring full power. No farm can be said to be properly run unless there's a brown dog in some position of authority. They will herd cows and pigs, keep the chickens out of the house garden, and keep the area free from skunks, which accounts in a large measure for the rather distinct odor. No boy can be properly raised without one. I think it was Robert Benchley who once remarked, every boy should have a dog. It teaches him to turn around three times before lying down. Brown dogs do a great deal more than that. They provide excuses for adventures, teaching him how to whistle loud and clear, improve his throwing arm, and most important, instill in him the incredible responsibility that comes with being loved unquestionably, totally, and irrevocably. Brown dogs are famous for the nonchalant, sophisticated attitudes. They have an air of having seen it all before, an attitude of preoccupation. Mine would stop now and then and stare into the middle's distance, as if pondering some crucial question for a minute or so, Then, having resolved it to his satisfaction, he'd shake his head, as though wishing he could impart this gem of knowledge to me, but somehow felt it would be wasted, or more likely that I would simply not understand its value. The narrow achievements of ordinary gun dogs, pointers, setters, or retrievers, seem to amuse the all-capable brown dog. Anyone who has owned one knows that they will bring back anything that can carry or drag. They will turn a brush pile inside out for the rabbit hunter, or circle a squirrel tree at precisely the right pace and distance to put the squirrel just where you want him. Pointing birds seems to bore them, but get one working pheasants, and he'll herd and flush them your way as easily as you run a pasture full of Holsteins back to the barn. For a farm boy who wants results, fried rabbit or squirrel stew, the brown dog is absolutely guaranteed to get the job done. A brown dog will tolerate a boy's family, but will not get too involved. If the boy is absent, say during school days, he will mope around or curl up close to where the master will first appear upon coming home and wait. If there are things he has to attend to, rounds to make or whatever, never doubt that the sound of the school bus will fall in his ears first and farthest away. When the owner of a brown dog I know went off to college, the dog would move out the end of the lane about a day and a half before his pal was due home. How did he know? I haven't the foggiest idea. Since the boy's father didn't know when to expect a home either, it's even more mysterious. Except that if you're a brown dog, you're expected to know such things, and it's your job to act on them. Brown dogs are never trained in the common usage of words. They just figure out what has to be done, and then do it. If you need someone to sit and listen to your problems, they'll lend you a most sympathetic ear. If you're bursting with spring, they'll race up and down the brook with you, and even walk a little taller when you bring mom the first sprigs of myrtle or watercress. I suspect they like summer best of all because everybody's home. Brown dogs are very fond of parties, swimming hole picnics, hay rides, summer softball games, fireworks, bicycling, fishing trips, and camping out. They make good outfielders and lifeguards, and I wouldn't have dreamed of sleeping on the lawn without my brown dog to watch over me, nor would he have allowed it in the first place. Most problems with brown dogs stem from their intelligence and unswerving desire to please. Mine went along with me in my first 22 to watch me get rid of a few groundhogs in one of the pastures. I suppose I shot two or three, I forget. But he got the idea that we wanted groundhogs, and nearly every day, all that summer, he brought one home. The problem was that he didn't bring them home immediately, but waited a day or so until they were more impressive, both in size and smell. That little lesson wasn't lost on me either. I learned that there were certain outings to go on alone after that, especially when I was going to shoot snakes in the ice pond or around the place in the brook where we liked to swim. What would have happened if he had decided we wanted water snakes strung out on the porch? It still fills me with pangs of desperation. One neighbor had to keep a chain around the kitchen icebox door after his brown dog learned to open and close it. 
It was a mystery where the food was going for a while, since it was smart enough not to take a lot or too big of a piece, just a small snack now and then to tide him over in the evening hours. Another had to tie the dog in the cellar of the barn if he felt I had to spank his son, and even then the dog would snarl a little at him for two or three days, as if to say he knew and didn't like the idea at all. It's a shame that not everyone has a brown dog to help him over the rough spots or to share that time of incredible wonder and discovery. A brown dog is a special gift we should have at a certain time of our life to round it all out. A brown dog belongs to that time of life which is filled with dreams of what we see today as small things. A hammer 22, slingshots, a first knife of your very own, and hip boots. The little keys that open the first doors to the outdoor treasures we now prize above price. Somehow brown dogs understand these things and know how to share them. I used to think with pride overflowing that my brown dog was mine, and now I know better. We never really own a dog as much as he owns us. Where he led, I would follow without fear, and even now remembering how he would curl up with his back against my bedroom door, I know again how it was to feel safe and protected from anything and anyone. Once when I was very small and very sick, my mother put him in bed with me against everyone's advice. They need each other, she said, and that was that. She understood brown dogs and their peculiar magic. It's getting about the time for another brown dog to come and live around the place. Sometimes I feel a strange cold draft at night, and a brown dog would know just how to curl us back up against a door to keep it from troubling me.